adjourned. We'll move right on to the committee of a whole meeting. The clerk, please call the here. Carbonero here. Martin absent. Ranky here. Shipman here. President Wallace here. First item on the committee agenda uh, for July 2nd, 2013 is under planning and zoning. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We have the uh, Labella Banquets and Petitioner Nick Scardino, Bartlett Commons, LLC. The subject site is 810 South Route 59, Bartlett Commons Shopping Center, and the request is special use permits, banquet hall and live entertainment and live music. Any better on the... Uh, presentation now Jim uh, I will have to verbally describe this one <laughs> it is not as visually stunning as the other one because it is really a build out in an existing building but uh, I can uh, go over that if you'd like right now be great uh, Nico Scardino Bartlett Commons LLC has petitioned to get a special use for a banquet Hall and live entertainment for live music for Labellus Banquets. Uh, they are going to be hoped to be operating in what was formerly the Benjamin Moore store at the 810 unit of the Bartlett Common Shopping Center on the northwest corner of Stearns and Route 59. They are essentially taking that Benjamin Moore store, putting in uh, some petition walls, seats, and chairs, but not a kitchen, and they are planning on renting this out for dinners, parties, rehearsals, baptisms, and business meetings. In our, in our zoning ordinance, a B3 for a banquet facility is a special use. Because there is no kitchen facilities, all food would be catered by outside restaurants, and therefore the county health department does not require a permit or an inspection. The facility will be divided into two party rooms, one with 80 seats and one with 64, for a total of 144 seats. The facility would be avail available for rent Sunday through Thursday from 8 to 1 and Friday, Sat Friday and Saturday from 8 to 2. If there is liquor served at this at an event, the caterer will be required to obtain a Village of Bartlett Class K liquor license or have one in his possession or, or her possession already, and then liquor can be catered. If they are just serving food, it can be catered by any food service entity. There is also a special use permit for live entertainment. The customers <coughs> would be allowed to have bands or DJs for their event and the music would be limited from 12 p.m. to 12 a.m. and 12 p.m. to 1 a.m. on Friday and Saturday. The required banquet facility is, is needing 45 parking spaces. There are 397 parking spaces in the Bartlett Common Shopping Center. Staff believes this will accommodate the proposed use. The uh, staff recommended approval of this subject to the hours of operation, which I stated, Sunday through Thursday, 8 a.m. to 1 a.m., Friday, Saturday, 8 a.m. to 2 a.m. Live music is limited from 12 p.m. to 12 a.m. and from 12 p.m. to 1 a.m. Friday and Saturday. As I stated, the caterer providing liquor for the event must have a valid Class K license with the village. Uh, no outside entertainment or banquet seating shall be permitted, so everything has to remain inside. The plan commission reviewed this and held a public hearing. There were some residents at the meeting that came and expressed concern about the live music with the existing facility at Bannerman's and that this may cause additional problems. Uh, those minutes are attached for your review. After reviewing the public hearing, or conducting the public hearing, reviewing the case, the Planning Commission recommended approval. And as you stated, those minutes are attached for your review as well as the petitioner's uh, layout of his building, uh, interior design with the seating arrangements. And if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer those. And I believe the petitioner is here. Does the petitioner any. have anything you'd like to like to say? Yeah. Do you have anything you'd like to say, Nico? Uh, I 
Hi, my name is Nico Scardino. I'm the petitioner for the La Bella Banquets facility. Um, pretty much just uh, just want to let people know that uh, our facility is, is not going to be a facility like, for example, people kind of try to um, compare me to like a Bannerman's where the live entertainment is going to be something that's going to be loud and disruptive to the neighbors or the, uh, the area. It's just going to be a facility where people can come and rent, rent the, uh, the facility uh, for whatever venue, um, as, as you explained, and uh, just kind of have the, uh, the, the live entertainment being a background music kind of like for, for dinner and enjoyment. Nothing, uh, nothing outrageous or crazy. Any questions for Nick? Yeah, Nick, I have, I have a, <clears throat> a couple questions. Are are you are you stuck on these uh, times? Uh, do you have any, or would you be a little more flexible as far as the times? I'm looking at this and I'm seeing uh, Sunday Sunday evening, which means Monday morning till one a.m. Mm -hmm. Isn't that a little late? Well, I can't, I can't uh, you know, I mean, being that, that we do have a, a facility within the shopping center that is allowed to have their music go on as, as late as it is right now, I feel that, you know, if anyone else were to come in and rent out the facility for, for a venue as well, to be any less would only be against me. And, uh, I mean, I can't... Uh, Tell people that uh, well, I gotta cut your your event or time short. I, well, I wouldn't want to. You know, because we and some of the neighbors did come in and testify, um, uh, and they are your neighbors. They're yes. not, you know, crazy people to walk off the street. They're your neighbors. Sure. Um, and uh, that seems to be one of the biggest concerns besides the noise. Um, and I. Uh, why we should have a little more flexibility with that. That's all. Um, I also want to ask. Uh, I'm not sure how. What What's the time limit on a on a, a K license? Anybody? I don't recall. I believe that a K license is issued. We have several of them in the village, and I believe they're done on an annual basis, just like any liquor license. Yeah, but there's a time frame. I yeah. don't remember it. Huh? There's no time limit on the There's a time. I don't there's no time what. limit. Yes, there is. Yeah. No? Yes? Oh, the time limit on the K license right. itself? I'm sorry. Yeah, I thought you meant the question. time frame for the license. K license. Yeah, it's not license is Sunday through Thursday 8 a.m. to 1 a.m. and Friday and Saturday 8 a.m. to 2 a.m. That's the same as his hours. His hours match the K license. Yeah. But since this would, is... I guess they would have to. Well, but this is a special use, so I think that that provides the board with some flexibility uh, that you might think about, uh, Trustee Aarons, relative to your first comment. In other words even though those are the hours of the liquor license, that doesn't mean that the live entertainment couldn't have more restrictive hours as a condition okay. of the special use, if that's what the board so chose to do. Well, I would, um, as for me, I would, uh, I think your idea is great, and uh, um, far be it for me to discourage anybody from doing new kinds of business in town. But I, I would uh, then uh, suggest that we look at a little more restrictive hours as far as live entertainment. During the week? Hmm? During the week? Um, during the week, yeah. Especially during the week. And, I, you know, 2 a.m., if you're having a catered affair, um, I mean, do they really go that late? Of course, me. I, I'm out of there by 11 o'clock, so <laughs> 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 I never see <laughs> Usually, usually it's it's between the one and two o'clock time. I mean, you can you can kind of probably you know within within the facility you know let them know that you know maybe music or or even alcohol needs to needs to be stopped an hour before, like some bars do. You know, an hour before an hour before they they close. But um, I'd hate to discourage people and tell them that uh, they can't go as long as what within the, at least the, at least the, the the shopping center holds for other places. Okay. 
Well, then I, I might suggest that um, uh, we look at, if anybody else agrees, you, maybe nobody will, that the uh, Hour for Live music from uh, 12 p.m. to 11 p.m. Sunday through Thursday and 12 p.m. Um, 12 p.m. to midnight on Friday and Saturday. That's for the live music. Could you live with that? And, and before you answer that, Nico, are you delineating live music and DJ? Are there two differences there? Because I noticed that a lot of the questions during planning were the fact that live music has the loud bass banging drums and is there any when you use the term live music are we delineating DJ and officially live music live well I mean there's like I know people when they when they when they do like uh, uh, rehearsal weddings and stuff like that they they do hire a band or like a uh, a live band, but it's it's not to the extent of of the aggressiveness that no, a normal bar would do. That is going to exert the the music in a thirteen thousand, fourteen thousand square foot facility versus a fifteen hundred square foot place. I mean, it's going to be completely night and day compared to what what they're going to, what they're going to be uh, pumping out. But we don't know that it's not going to be just as disturbing to the neighbors. Well, to that to that point, if I if I can, for and I don't want to stray too far from this specific application, but in general, if if this particular business or any business were to have complaints of noise, and either Madam Administrator or perhaps the Police Chief, what is what do we do at that one o'clock in the morning hour? How how do we fix that, and what do we have, and have we considered? Again, I don't want to stray too far from this. So in, in a brief rundown what have we considered as alternatives to enforcement if we don't have anything with teeth because it seems in reading the minutes that was the primary objective and I think it seems for all of us that's kind of at the heart of what the issue is um, I think if I'm understanding you right TL you want to cut the hours back based on the music so really at the heart of the problem here is the music and it being too loud so what do, what what can we do to address that well, we, the, when a resident has called, and every time they call, we send out the police department uh, to respond to the call. We have adopted the IEPA noise uh, requirements, but we, we, the EPA enforces them, so they're not going to be out there at 1 a.m. with their noise measurements. So we rely upon the officer's judgment, uh, and I think the chief will tell you several times they've been out there and they have agreed with the residents and they've talked to the owner. There were some times when they didn't feel there was an issue. So I think that it sort of falls under the category of public nuisance, and that is in the eyes of the officer. Am I correct, Chief? Yes, you are. Uh, the officer will go out there and, and do a, a based on the totality of the circumstances, do a balancing test between uh, tolerance and temperance, in other words, is this a tolerance issue or is this an issue for the business to actually turn it down? There are times that officers go out there and they squint their eyes and they really can't hear anything and they're going to have a hard time acting on it. There's other times where they go out there and there's a legitimate complaint and they go and talk to the management and ask them to turn it down and they do. So, uh, but that's, it depends on uh, the, who we're talking about. Uh, obviously this is an unknown, but generally businesses are very compliant with officer requests. And I know that we wouldn't have this issue with Mr. Scardino, but if a business were to say, nah, I'm leaving my music up. Yeah, well, then it would be up to uh, the individual complainant to want to issue a, uh, to sign a complaint. For so the, the person who called 911 at 1 o'clock in the morning is going to need to sign a complaint. That's right. Okay. That's right. And we don't have a specific decibel limitation in the ordinance. Is that correct or not? That is not correct. There are okay. specific decibel levels that are in the uh, state EPA ordinance, and we have adopted that by reference. Okay, because I saw that in the, that statement mm -hmm. in the minutes, so I was cons you know, yes, confused when you made that statement. If we in, in the past, when we have had noise complaints generated by businesses, and the one instance is it was a manufacturing business next to residential, we hired an outside consultant. He did the noise test, found that the decibel level from business to residential was exceeded. We made the business aware of it. They corrected the scenario. So that's what we would have to do in a situation like this. 
It's a little different for a band. It's not like a constant humming of a machine, but we would have to go out there and do the same kind of testing. You know, if, if I may add to it, um, there's also another thing I, I could probably either do to also maybe help in the situation. When they, when whoever it is comes to rent the space, I could always have in there at least something that would maybe deter them from um, trying to, to raise, raise the volume, I guess, and being considerate of the people around. I could have in there a stipulation in, in my contract with them indiv individually saying that, you know what, they would... They would um, de um, they would lose their their security deposit. I, I guess according to um, renting the facility. At least this way, no one wants to lose money. So if they if they are going to be considered being held liable for disturbing the peace or the area or the or, or the neighbors in the in the surrounding surrounding area, that would be something that they would um, have to have to deal with. I mean, that's something I could add on on, on a one to one basis as far as wanting to rent the the, the space. I can always add that in, in my uh, agreement with them. Well, if I'm, and actually, if I'm reading your notes here right, Jim, it says a petition under point six, the petitioners requesting a special use permit for live entertainment, that they'd be allowed, da 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 da. The hours for live music would be limited to 12 to 12, Sunday through Thursday, and 12 to 1 on Friday and Saturday. So that's kind of doing what you're asking, correct? That's a condition that was, add, was added. Nico actually moved the live music back from the full hours of operation, but he did that on before our meeting and before the planning commission, so they okay. made that a condition. So, so I understand the planning commission suggested moving it from 2 to 1 and from 1 to 12. Is that accurate? He moved the music back from, yes, from the full uh, hours of operation of the event. The liquor license goes an hour longer. Yeah. And in his petition, he was petitioning for an hour less than the class K would have allowed. It, that wasn't, and the plan commission adopted that as a condition. But that was already part of the application. So that wouldn't necessarily be the hours of operation. That's just the hours that the live music could operate. That's correct. Right. They could still be there with the music down and still be serving alcohol. Until and in fact, they could stop serving alcohol at 2 a.m., but the facility, could the facility remain open? Because it's not the liquor license on the facility now. <laughs> or is this another one of those weird questions that I can't? This is a weird question just because it's a caterer's license. <laughs> but I would say that's it. <laughs> Shutting down then. Is there any other um, support for TL's suggestion of limiting the hours to 11 on weekdays? Another point I'd, I'd like to bring up there's nothing personal, okay? Um, uh, because you know I like your stuff um, when uh, there was there was for quite some time well I don't know how long it was but we had a problem with a, a, a local uh, bar that had a license until two o'clock and it wasn't uh, it, it had nothing to do with with the alcohol being served it had to do with when they close up people walk out they're in a celebratory mood they might be a little intoxicated and they're loud, and you, and you've got people. It, there's just people so close there. Um, I don't know. If if you if you all don't think it's a good idea, then you know we'll go with the petitioner's request. But I just I was just hoping maybe I could convince somebody to go for the short hours. I, I would be inclined to go for the shorter hours, but I would rather um, provide the request the way it's granted, and then. If we do have a consistent problem, readdress it. I don't know that we can. legally that would be difficult to yeah. add a condition after you grant the special use. You but we, take action on the liquor license, but really you could it would hold have to Nico be accountable for the extra added information in your contract. Yes. Well, but he, in this instance, he's entering a contract with himself. Yeah. So here, he, Nico's the landlord and the tenant of this space. So he's talking about. I think adding provisions for other tenants in in the shopping center. Yeah. Um, but who's uh, he'd be a landlord enforcing a provision <laughs> against a tenant? Understood. No offense, but no, I understand. <laughs> may not work it. <laughs> Any other? Okay. Any other questions for Nico? 
of the board? Is there anyone else that would have questions from the audience or want to speak to the board? Um, I was actually uh, here for a different reason, but this... Uh, uh, I need you to state your name and address. I apologize. Matt Windsor, uh, 741 Cove Court. Um, I was here for a different reason, but this perked up my ears. I'm actually, uh, the company that I own does event production, live sound, DJs, that type of stuff. And we primarily do private events, weddings, that type of stuff. And um, any professional having to deal with an event that's smaller, like uh, what, what, I'm sorry, what was your name? Nico was uh, explaining he's playing for the room he's not playing like a bar or a nightclub um the guests don't want to hear loud blasting music when they're at a private event because people are there from age 90 to 9 and uh i, I really think the music isn't going to be as loud as everyone thinks it is um just from a professional standpoint thank you thank you Anyone else have anything else? Come on up. I'm Tiffany Dunsing. I am a neighbor of the strip mall. Um, I'm actually not targeting Nico or Bannermans or anything like that. I'm looking for a broader ruling on um, commercial strip malls near residential areas. I'm looking for um, conditions to be put on these permits of sound and time limitations. And it's not just Nico, but just like you said, I agree exactly with TL. What she proposed is what I'm in agreement to. And um, when this was approved by the Planning Commission, they said that they were comparing it to the log cabin. And that has conditions on it. 11 o'clock is their time to quit. And um, that's kind of, I'm looking at a cumulative noise, just not Nico, but Nico, Nico's two rooms, Bannerman's, whatever goes into the Tuesday morning empty store. I'm looking at the whole strip mall. That's all. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Rochelle Probilski, and I'm also a neighbor of Tiffany's right in back of uh, Nico's establishment. And um, I want to congratulate our new village president and the new trustees, and glad to see everybody else who's been in office. Thank you. Um, bear with me. I have a few notes here. Um, I have lived in Bartlett since 1975. I'm in my third Bartlett home. Bought it 10 years ago because of my husband's health issues, and we had trouble finding a ranch in Bartlett. That's why we ended up where we did. Otherwise, we probably would have gone in a more residential area. Um, we have supported local businesses and restaurants for many years. My husband was in uh, veteran organizations. I'm in two in town. We do. I have been at a lot of um, events at the fire barn, the oak room, the log cabin. I'm still setting up tables before an, a meeting and tearing it down at the log cabin. This being said, and with all due respect to what Nico stated regarding having family parties, I am concerned. And Nico, I would like to preface what I say, that we have been through a lot in the past. That's why there are concerns. Things do come up. As I said in the earlier meeting that we attended here, what standards would be in place for it? And say parking, what would stop people to go around the corner and park in our neighborhood if it was an issue? The Nest Cafe might very well go back into business. I hope it does um, with somebody else in there. Um, he stated that about the soundproof wall being built between the two rooms. Could there be one band or DJ using the two rooms versus two separate ones? I'm not sure how the setup would be. Um, FYI, also referencing the log cabin, it does state in the contract that, a, that the renter has to be 21 years of age and has to be there at the event the total time. Uh, last time, last meeting, Nico mentioned that he would have a caterer be there and be responsible. That sort of scares me, actually. And this I 
bear with me with this. I don't like to say this, but is there going to be anything preventing a group of people to have a bachelorette or bachelor party with adult entertainment? I was made aware of those being held in the village at previous village hall meetings. Somebody told me that. What type of contract is there going to be? Is the village going to look at the contract? I say this because this is a totally different business than what we have in town. It's not, it's just totally different. I spoke to Jerry Faber, who's here, and he's lived across in the log cabin for many years, and there have been problems, and neighbors of his have had to call the police. That curfew, as Tiffany said, is 11. My husband was a very, very ill man uh, before he passed away. He could not sleep many nights because of the noise that we've had. And again, I don't want to punish Nico for what we've gone through in the past, but you know, it's a cause for concern. Um, it's always fun to be at a party. It's always fun to be the one and with the loudest uh, people, like, at least me. I like to have fun. I like to laugh. Um, I wish Nico the best. He's always been decent. He's always been respectable. And he shows that he is a person of quality standards. And I, Nico, I ask you to stand by your word. I ask you to develop standards to be followed. It is a shame, but the neighborhood has been through other situations that has made us aware of how we as people think differently and do not always realize how noise can travel. And after all this, it is not a special permit for just one day a year. This is 52 weeks a year. This is in our neighborhood. This is around our homes. Thank you very much for listening to me. My name is Debbie Coletta. I also live behind the shopping center. And I just had a couple of questions. Uh, one was there was no mention of a dance floor. And usually I do some event planning and things like that. And usually when a party is being held, if there is live music or a DJ or a band, it is because they intend to dance. If not, then I believe usually like a banquet hall for a shower that would just have background music. The other concern I have is what guidelines, Nico, do you intend to have to keep from someone renting the facility and turning it into a club night where they start selling tickets? And how much control will you have over that? Those were a couple of questions that I had. Thank you for your attention. You want to address the ticket thing? That would be within the zoning. Um, that would be illegal, right? Yes, he, he addressed that at the plan commission and said that in his lease it would be rented and it wouldn't be for that kind of outside venue. It would be part of the lease restrictions. But our, you could add that as a condition. The plan commission did not, but he adequately addressed it at the plan commission. As just as far as the adult use type of party, we do have a zoning control over adult uses within the village, and this location would not, would, would not, they would not be obviously allowed, and that would be a, not only a zoning enforcement, but we'd have to go through that process. It would be, I'm sure, a police matter before it got to the zoning, but we would pursue it on both issues. I guess my question kind of still goes back to my earlier thoughts, if I mean, unless there were other people to talk, I apologize. I'm sorry. Um, my question goes back to, again, I, I know Nico's a good business person here in town. He's, he's a nice man. But let's say it goes haywire, and we're having a lot of complaints and a lot of problems and verified complaints by the police. What's, what teeth do we have once we've, been grant, once we've granted this special use permit? Once, once we've crossed that line, what do we do, what do, we do to, uh, to enforce it or to change it? From a special use standpoint, the zoning ordinance that you will adopt will be an enforceable ordinance in the village. And we can pursue the enforcement of that ordinance, say if the hours of operation are exceeded, say if the Class K liquor license is not obtained, or there's drinking there without it, I think then it crosses over into a police matter. And I'll let the police chief answer that part. And as you're well aware, if, if crimes are committed or ordinance violations are committed and we cite uh, that offense, it would be brought in front of the Liquor Commission and they, and they could make a determination on the status of the liquor license at that point. At least that's the way we've done it. What happens if we issue this 
this permit to them, and then there's a ton of noise calls. Yeah, that's a quality of life issue. If it doesn't rise to the level of uh, uh, an actual ordinance violation, it's still a real issue for these neighbors, and that's right. the that's, that's topic that's my of discussion concern. here, right? Once we issue this, if, if we do get a lot of calls, can we change it, or is this something that once we give it to them, no, that's it? Once we've granted zoning, we can't. I, take I think that goes to bringing the issue in front of the liquor commissioner. That's a liquor ordinance violation issue, and and that's up to uh, the mayor as a liquor commissioner to uh, review those standards, to look at what's been going on, and decide about some kind of uh, temporary uh, fine or revocation or or all of those items that that are available to him under the state law. And. To the extent there's conditions in the special use, special use can be revoked. Um, to the extent the village wide made additional ordinances controlling that type of thing, those could be enforced. So, uh, if there were a problem, they, there are things you could do. Is there anyone in attendance, uh, anyone else that would like to speak? Any other questions by the board? So, uh, just so I'm clear, my simple mind, um, we have noise, hours of operation, unexpected uses, um, and what teeth do we have when these things could go awry? And if I'm hearing administrator right, if something does consistently happen, the, the penalties that we could enforce without changing the ordinance would be restricting the Class K liquor license. And that would be basically end what most of his events would be. Well, that's right. Or restricting or, or revoking the special use. You had that option as well as an entire board. But one of the things I, I want to clarify is the hours as they proposed hours as they stand now, because as I understand it, it's different than the, what's in the memo because they voluntarily no, no. changed the hours. No, the conditions in the memo are the hours of operation for the banquet hall is number A. Okay. And then the live music is limited in B to 12 p.m. to 12 a.m and from 12 p.m. to 1 a.m. on Friday and Saturday. TL asked if you could kick that back one more hour and, and um, that, yeah, on, on both of those both items. Of those. So that was limited by the plan commission. Would you, if there's no support for that, then we should move on. Well, then I'd move that we bring this on to the uh, board for a final vote at the uh, next meeting. How do we have the morning discussion? Move it. You could. Move it onto the board. What's that? Are you moving it onto the board? Yes, that's what I just did, I thought. Okay. <laughs> I'm moving it onto the board for a final vote. Okay. We can do that. Okay. Thank you. Are you finished? Yep. That would be it. Thank you all for your comments Thanks. on that. Thanks. Thanks, Nico. Next item on the uh, committee agenda uh, falls under the public works. And um, Trustee oh, Aarons. My turn. <clears throat> um, as you all know, we've been very concerned about the emerald ash borer, that little creepy little bug that's been killing all of our ash trees. And so the village staff has put together a plan. It's, uh, uh, let's see. Well, I should probably let you do this, right, Paul? You're so, you're so much more eloquent than I am. Um, anyway, the, it, in response to this problem, this village uh, uh, white problem, um, staff has presented us with a plan. And uh, Mr. Kester, will you please elaborate on that? Thank you. Uh, this is uh, a change from our existing plan that we've had to uh, attack the emerald ash bore. Uh, what we've done in prior years is uh, the board adapted a program that what we would do is 
we only addressed the trees that were actually dead. There were a lot of communities that came through in clear-cut subdivision, clear-cut blocks to try and eliminate the, uh, try and stop that from spreading around there. Uh, what we did in this community, as the trees were infected, infested, they were cut down at that time on a one-by-one -one tree, trying to leave the trees stand as much as possible um, as they were. And the, what we did start last year is we started some insecticide program. We had looked at all sorts of different insecticides, injections, and we started treating last year a 1,000 trees by uh, safari trunk spray. And we did uh, select a certain particular areas that were, uh, we felt that would be able to help out with that. There is not one chemical or one treatment out there that has been found or known yet that will prevent or kill the emerald ash borer. What you're doing is you're slowing down the area of in infestation and trying to uh, control or budgetarily work with the, the die-off in that area. We have tried some areas with smaller diameter trees. We've seen about 50% 50, 50 of them working. We have also, this year, we're continuing to treat an additional or the same 50% as last year, and we're, we're moving into a different area. Again, it takes a certain type of tree that's eligible for the uh, spray. All trees cannot be treated. It, it will work more on the smaller trees of nature. So what we've looked at, and we've tried to do that, and that plan had been working along as we were trying to keep up with the dying trees. Unfortunately, with the drought that hit us last year also, just excelled this little bug to even kill more trees. Um, last year, we had identified about 250 trees that were for, for earmarked for removal last year. We did go through and we uh, did get that down and get those removed. This year, we saw so much more did not leaf out this year. We did do an inventory as of June 1st of this year, and we have 988 dead standing ash trees right now. Total ash trees in, in the town are a little over 5,000 uh, currently. We do estimate we'll probably lose close to 3,000, if not a little bit more. And some people are saying, well, if, why only that? Why not all of them? There's different uh, species of the ash tree, the green ash, the white ash. We're seeing that the green ash, um, the green ash are affected, the white ash are, are, are holding up better. So that's why we're not going to lose, we don't believe we'll lose all the ash trees. It's really hard to determine, and by anybody just going out there and seeing if you have a green ash or a white ash, they're very hard to do, hard to determine which one you have. So this year, what we're planning on doing is continuing the spraying. We're, we're starting to finish that, trying to finish that up yet this year, uh, spraying of a 1,000 trees to try and help out the smaller trees that will... Uh, we do believe that it will try and slow down the slow down the bug and, and from not moving on any further. In the meantime, we have to take down those other trees. We cannot do those all in house, so I'm requesting us we'll need to go out and get contractors to take down some of the larger trees in town. We'll still continue to do some in house. We do believe that um, we'll be removing roughly a thousand trees a year in the next three years to take down two thousand. I'm sorry, a total of th right around three thousand trees within the next three years. That gets the trees down and cleared out. Now we come into the reforestation of those trees. I'd love to be able to turn around as I take a tree down, reforest it right away. It's just totally, you know. Staffing, impossible. Cost is very difficult to, to come up with that also. The way we've addressed the reforesting in prior years is we have a 50-50 tree program. Once a year, we go out for bids for trees. The residents would, uh, in the BART letter, we would put a list in of those trees that would be offered. We would, uh, in past years, the residents would pay 50% of the tree, they would be able to pick their species of tree, and the tree would be planted in the fall or the spring, depending on what it, what it, uh, 
when it would be best to plant that. That worked in years prior to the emerald ash bore coming in there. I do not believe that that's going to be the way to reforest it in the future. Number one, the cost is pretty expensive on that. And it's just a participation issue. The past couple of years have been right around 90, 80, 90, 100 residents partaking in that. That would take us forever to reforest the trees. What I'm proposing, to, what I would like to do is I would like to, I would propose two different reforesting programs. One would be a smaller tree in diameter, um, and the smaller tree would be a, an inch and a half in diameter. The village would pick the species and plant them where needed, or we would plant them where we've removed trees. For instance, the north end of town, we know we have 250 205 trees on the north end of town. That part of North Avenue, and what, or what I'm saying, the north end, Oak and North Avenue, northeast section in there, that was going to definitely be clear cut. All the trees over there are all ash trees. 90% of them are ash trees over there. That area is just, it, it is all died off at this point. That area, I would propose that the village would go in there, plant the trees, pay for all the trees, go through and, and, and reforest that area. So one program would be trying to plant, next year starting the full blown program, a thousand trees in a year. I would propose that the village would be able to buy a smaller tree, more trees for a cheaper cost to the village and we would reforest everything, or all those trees that would be removed. The other part of the program is a modified 50-50 program. We would offer a larger tree in diameter, a two and a half inch diameter, what we have always done in the 50-50 in the program. So the same size tree, a larger tree than what they would be getting at no cost. They would be able to pick the species of that and only pay a flat fee of $50 instead of 50%, $50 towards that tree. And that I do believe that the, some residents would partake in that, that they'd be able to get a larger tree, and it would cost them 50 bucks, $50 more than that. Get a larger tree, they would get to pick, the, pick their choice of trees and um, get a larger tree and participate in that. And they would have their choice with the larger trees. So. What we're looking at, we will definitely need um, some additional funding for removal. And then the two different programs that we're proposing with the tree reforesting. Um, and we'll need additional money for that also. Um, what, as far as the financial standpoint of that, uh, we have put together a spreadsheet for the next four year program. Obviously this year being the, the um, the, the, the three-year program is here for reforesting and starting for next year for reforesting. Um, we're, we would, I would like to try and do a thousand trees planting, half of it in the springtime, half of it in the fall. Um, we're estimating that it would cost the village for, um, for the replacement of those trees uh, next year $110,000 to replace almost a thousand trees. This fall we would try and start a smaller program reforesting about 300 trees total for 30,000. Uh, next year 210 for reforesting and then in 2015 and 16, 210 and I'm sorry 110 and 80 totaling for reforesting about $330,000. That's just for planting the new trees. For removal of the trees, um, that's born on us 100%. That's the village's responsibility. Smaller trees, uh, roughly $225 for removal. Larger trees, $450. We're looking at $337,000. Yet this year, $337,000 next year and the next two years. In, in total. So over the next three to three and a half, or three, next four years, $1.3 million is what is needed to address the ash trees at this point. Are we going to, um, I'm a, 
a little confused. Are we going to be discontinuing the 50-50 tree program in the interim? Is that where some of the funding will be coming from? A fully 50-50 program, I'm looking at modifying the 50-50 program, that it would be a $50 pay for the residents, two and a half inch diameter tree, they would be able to pick the species of tree. Okay. So they, they'd be paying $50, a larger tree, and pick their species. And at the end of the three-year program, we would go back to the regular 50-50 as we know it now. Yeah. Okay. Any questions? Yes. Uh, Paul, when we're talking about the tree removal, um, and you've mentioned that we'd have to outsource some of the removal to the larger trees. Do you envision it's going to be that entire 500 amount of the large trees? On this list for each year the 500 of the large trees will have to contract those out yes now it seems like if you look at this over the at least the three years I'm seeing for two hundred twenty five thousand dollars for three years pretty sizable amount of money what what holds us back from doing something in-house I mean is it that we just don't have the equipment uh, we don't have the manpower it just seems like if we're going to farm out this much and spend this much on these trees, we could almost do something in-house, buy new equipment, you know, hire a new person. I don't, I don't know. I'm just saying well, it's a lot of money to sure, spend. Sure. All of the above. We would need additional equipment. We would need additional staffing. Uh, the larger trees, our cherry picker or our, our lift, man lift that we have, is not large enough to address these these larger trees we right now we're sharing our lift between our street lights our smaller trees our tree trimming that we still have to do and let alone taking down the emerald ash board or the ash trees we still have other trees to maintain mm -hmm. there's only 38 percent of our trees that we're addressing with these we still have that 60 some odd percent that we still have to maintain that's done with our cherry pickers so we would need additional equipment and also chippers but the big issue is manpower man and staffing on that to do a tree removal you need to have a three and a three to a four man crew to turn around and do that right now I'm able to take from other departments and come up with a three man crew for for a removal on the smaller trees um, with our kind when I'm saying contracting out, this is including of stumping, taking the stumps out. Right now, I have no equipment. The village owns no equipment to take any stumps out. So even if we are taking down a tree in house, I still have to hire a contractor to turn around and take the stumps out. So right now, I don't have the equipment even to take care of all the trees that we're taking down in house. I have to bring in someone else to do that. So it is equipment that would be needed and manpower. So, Paul, on the small tree removal, the 225 per tree on that, that's stump, stump removal? Or what is that? The 225 is if we would contract that out. Okay. I do believe the smaller trees, we would be able to do some of those. Even on the trees that we would be able to do in house, I'd probably have, you know, 35 to $50 for a stump removal. I do believe that the smaller tree amount could come down at some point, but there's going to be even equipment that we're going to need to maintain breakdowns failures with our own so we could get that 250 or that 500 down cut that in half and uh, I'd be able to commit to do half of those in house it does kind of surprise me that the village as many trees we do have to maintain that the village wouldn't own a stump removal why why don't we we've never had the the opportunity we don't we prior to this emerald ash borer we did not really remove that many trees the half a dozen or the dozen two dozen trees that we would we would take down per year it was cheaper to have a contractor come in and stump those out than for us to do a capital investment in equipment I guess I just look at six hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars and think it could buy an awful lot of equipment or manpower or something. So, just my thoughts. But, but it's kind of like for a one, one-time deal. Well, I think you would. The future, you never know how many trees are going to come down. I guess but um, have another disease of some sort. You never know. I hope not. 
but from from what I've learned from the arborist, there's it, it's an ongoing issue. I mean, we had the elm, right? We had an issue with the elm trees. Um, he said it's just a matter of time before we have um, all villages have the same issue with another species of tree. Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> Do I don't. Do? I don't like to hear that. Uh, just, just a side point. I guess this just kind of struck me. How are we? Are we? Do are our guys trained to take these trees down? Most definitely. We have. We've sent our staff that we have that. Even our tree trimmers are our, our, our group of uh, staff that do tree removal or tree trimming. We do send them tra training on an annual basis. They're trained in house by our arborist, and we do outsource them for training also. Yes. Okay. Tree trimming training? Yes. Tree tra Easy for you. <laughs> I, where, what, do we do, what are we going to do with all that wood? Well, Put with the emerald ash yard. bore, the guidelines are that the, it cannot be removed from county to county. It has to be chipped up on, si or on site or in a close proximity to a less than one inch chip. And we're able to accomplish that with uh, um, our equipment. Or when we contract it out, they'll bring in a tub grinder for the large diameter. Oh, so I guess selling it as firewood would be... It's not, <laughs> not, 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 a good idea. not a good idea whatsoever. How about mulch? We do have mulch available if it is chipped up into the half inch or one inch or smaller. We have an overabundance of chips that um, it's very difficult to get rid of it at this point. But, but those little bugs are all gone, right? When it's chipped up less than an inch in, in uh, an inch or smaller, yes, they are destroyed. Well, we'll have to do some public relations on the mulch. Mm -hmm. I have a question for clarity. So, for the next <coughs> next four years, let's say I have a tree out in front of my house that was hit by lightning, I I would be able to participate in the fifty dollar if I remove that tree to replace it Be because I think what what TL was asking uh, previously was uh, what are we doing with the 50 50 that we have now we're putting it off to the side and gonna offer something different any within the next three years anybody participating in this program you know I'm, I, I can't go out there and I know that you have ash trees so you're gonna participate in that sooner or later Thank but you. <laughs> but um, yeah, if something happens to the tree in front of your home, if it dies within the next three years while we have this program, it's the $50 slash pro tree program. Yes. Okay. But you get the opportunity to have a tree for $50 instead of probably what would have been more under the 50 50 typically. Right. I look at it as less leaves to rake. And I believe to dovetail on one of the comments that Trustee Aaron's made. Um, was there some, do we have funding set aside already um, for the 50-50 program? Is there already funding that is set aside for that particular program that we would be partially using for this new venture? Every year what we do is we put in our, in our street department in our, in our capital budget for tree replacement, our 50-50 program. Typically what we always do in that is we, on, on the years prior, we have put um, $20,000 in there for tree replacement. That's about what it will cover with the residents participating with their 70 or 80, 80 or 90 trees, and then the village's share in there. So you're saying we have some change in there, but not enough. That's correct. Currently in the budget, for, we did bump it up last year for um, tree removal and also reforesting. We put a total of, Jeff, was it 110,000? 120. 125,000 last year's um, so we did bump it up last year unfortunately we have 125 to work with in the current budget not nearly enough is what we needed just for this current year when we did the budget we didn't uh, show this devastation with all the ash trees <coughs> and Paul you said that about approximately how many people take advantage of that 50 50 50 program 100 you said last year was we had more than expected and I think we had like 105 last year okay typically in prior years uh, the over the past 10 years we've probably ranged from 55 to 70 and is the average cost of these larger trees about $200 now is what you're projecting for them to be in the future I do believe that the trees 
with, that we can purchase this year by quantity, we can definitely get the, the dollar amount on those trees less than what they have been in prior years. So I guess over the past year or two, or in the, the, the village has brought in about maybe $10,000 if the, if the resident is paying 100 and we're paying 100 and so to take it down to 50, we're not really losing substantially that much in the grand scheme of things. We're losing, what, $5,000 if 100 people do it. Is that right, approximately? Well, last year's they were spending, the residents were about $100, $120 per person. If we knock it down to 50, if we were bringing in 10, we're going to bring in half of that amount as what we did from residents. Sure. So, yeah. so it's, I think it's a good gesture to the residents to lower it and uh even though we may not get as much money in it's still in the grand scheme of things it's not very much money anyway we're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars and reforesting the, the the village and i am recommending that relative to the takedown of the trees that we pay for that out of developer reserves and relative to the reforestation since we have uh three years to do that, four years to do that, that that would come out of our operating budget and we have the time to anticipate that and work that into our budgets uh, as we go along. I think the first thing you would see us do uh, if, if you think this is a, a fairly decent plan is that we would go out and we're prepared to do that uh, for bid for a contractor to begin taking down some of the larger trees and we do intend to do uh, start the reforestation programs uh, this fall to the extent possible. Yeah, I believe that's pretty important. We, the, the one resident that made comments made it perfectly clear that it was somewhat of an urgent situation in particular areas and you certainly don't want to get into a situation where some of these trees are are hazardous right. and, and a strong wind can start falling off and breaking and so. And obviously we're going to start on the north side uh, that's the area that's been impacted most heavily uh, and try to focus in terms of the trees we're putting in where we're putting them in uh, in that area first. Um, was there any, anybody in the audience that had any questions regarding this new plan? Mr. Brandy? Yeah, you can stay seated. I don't know why they're going to chase after them. You guys have been cutting down. I'm sorry. Three other trees. I'm supposed to say his name in a tree. They're black. They leave all sorts of trees. When we originally started it out, started the program out, it was. Um, the trees that were dead that we were getting calls on. We just did not go down the street and select them. They were generated by phone calls that came in. And that's when they first when they first came in, that is how they had died. Since then, everything on the north end is, is dead. Well, yeah. So this year, uh, contractors, that's how big the trees have to be, I guess. Yeah. Yes, things Believe it or not, those are work orders that we've had for close to six to eight months. Okay. So, so that is not our plan at this point. Our plan is that if the board does approve this, we would go through there, and it would go start at one end and continue down the block. For, for the record, could you state your name, please? Name and address, John. What's your name? Okay. Um, I think then we'll. Uh, I think there was somebody else. Not this at the next There was another gentleman who wished to speak. I think. Oh, I'm sorry. Is there any federal or state fund for national projects? Uh, and could you state your name and address, please? Lance Lemon, 950 Grand Street. Thank you. I think we have done what I would call a scorched earth review of that. And you can bet with everybody else in uh, this suburban area having the same problem that we do, uh, we have applied for grant after grant for the last three or four years, and we have nothing. We have several out there. Uh, and as you know, we have uh, requests into several of our legislators in Springfield uh, that if they have any uh, funds that might be coming back to their home area. We would like to use it for trees. and We haven't heard anything. Uh, but that certainly is something that we continue to look at. Anyone else? 
much. There's a gentleman right there. Could you come? Oh. Could you, could you stand Would you, up? you mind standing up and stating your name and your address for the record? Yeah, come here. Please. Right. Uh, I'm Jim Hall, 824 Redwood Lane. I would just like to make a comment on the equipment. If this is going to be a three or four year um, endeavor, that we should look at either purchasing or leasing the stump grinding equipment and training personnel, possibly leasing on a long term lease, and that way you don't have to worry about it once the program, uh, the tree replacement is over, you're through with the equipment. And so that, that would be a and compare it, get a cost of that compared to what it is to have it done uh, from an outside contractor. Thank you very much. Just one quick okay. question. I think that the the um, emerald beetles. Oh. Everybody knows those. What's those red beetles that we got now? We got the ones with the red body. Just for the record, Jim, can you state your name and address? Uh, Jim name Russell, and address, 109 Daniel. Please. I do believe you're talking of the box elder bugs. Is that what that is? Yeah. They are not a lot pests. of them. They, they're a pest to you and to me, but they're not, uh, they will not eat anything. Okay, just curious. Thanks, Paul. Is there any other special insurance you would need to operate that grinder? That may, would make it more costly to, to lease than to contract? I don't believe there would be any insurance, any other additional insurance requirements. Okay, I think that's it. I think um, I think we've got a plan. I think that the staff did um, quite well, um, and uh, I don't think any of us knows exactly what the devastation of losing all those trees is going to be, right. but we will know soon. Thank you. We'll move ahead with that. Thank you, Paul. Mayor, Trustee Aarons. Mayor, considering the size of our audience. Would it be appropriate if I asked for just a five-minute recess before we dive into this? Or? Certainly. Um, I apologize. That's a, that's a Quick five-minute recess, if the mayor and the board agrees to. Um, Trustee Shipman has uh, requested, and I agree, um, just to entertain a motion for a five-minute recess before we get into the next point on the agenda. So moved. Second. Moved by Trustee Shipman, seconded by Trustee Carbonero. Mr. Clerk, please call the roll. Trustee Aarons? Yes. Kammerer? Yes. Carbonero? Yes. Ranky? Yes. Shipman? Yes. Motion carries. Five minutes. Like to get this rolling again here? Math in my head, thank you. Yeah. I never made it over there, so I'm meeting back here. Probably all right. I'm setting myself. Yeah, sit in your empty bottle, please. <laughs> again, thank you for your patience. Uh, tendency to be long. Oh, yeah. Um, at this point, I'd like to call the meeting back to order. Um, 824, uh, July 2nd, Committee of the Whole Meeting. Will the clerk please call the roll? Trustee Aarons? Here. Kammerer? Here. Carbonero? Here. Ranky? Here. Shipman? Here. President Wallace? Here. At this point in the meeting, um, we'll be discussing a topic uh, on assault bans, uh, weapons ban, and I'm going to turn it over to our village attorney, uh, Brian Mraz, that's going to explain um, uh, bits and pieces. I asked him to try to keep it brief, <laughs> so because uh, I know there's a lot of people that want to talk, um, so he's going to give us an explanation of what it is we'll be discussing. Uh, on May 31st, 2013, both houses of the uh, legislature passed the uh, concealed carry legislation. And within that, they provided that municipalities that already had some gun control that included a, an assault ban, uh, or if you didn't, that within 10 days of the effective date of that 
legislation that local municipalities had the authority to uh, pass an assault ban ordinance. Now, that being said, it's from when the bill became effective. And so uh, today, the governor issued an amendatory veto. Um, and that uh, can be overridden by the legislature and likely will be. Uh, but when, so the bill does not become effective, House Bill 183, until the uh, amendatory veto is overridden. If it's not overridden, then what we have is a state law, which is the unlawful use of weapons law, and also the aggravated unlawful use of weapons, which was declared unconstitutional by the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. And when they declared it unconstitutional on Second Amendment grounds, they said, Illinois, you've got a deadline. And you've all been reading in the paper that uh, you have to do something. And that was extended once to July 9th. And that's likely to be the deadline. And that's likely to be the date by which the legislature will vote on whether or not to override the governor's veto. Um, One of the issues with uh, considering even an assault ban is that there's, there is no uh, definition of assault weapons in the state law. They leave it to municipalities to put that in their ordinance. And almost every one of the ordinances in which there's an assault ban, assault weapons ban, has been challenged in court. And most recently, from there is a Cook County assault weapons ban that uh, from 2006, I believe, and that just recently was uh, ruled and remanded back to the trial court. So that's the one that's out there. In fact, it applies to the both incorporated and unincorporated areas of Cook County, including uh, in the village of Bartlett. Uh, however, the village of Bartlett does not have its own ordinance, uh, weapons ban ordinance. That's what the board could, could consider. Um, and we don't have an intergovernmental agreement with Cook County to enforce that ordinance. Um, so the board can uh, decide, but there have been legal challenges. There has been threats of legal action if you do adopt an assault weapons ban. I believe you will almost need to be a weapons expert because uh, there are groups, the NRA, the Illinois Rifle uh, Association, that point out that the Cook County Ordinance is too broad and incorporates some sporting weapons and other <laughs> weapons that uh, they take offense to being banned. Again, it's a Second am Amendment issue. People feel very strongly one way or the other on this issue. Um, I'm not going to get into what the governor tried to do as an amendatory veto. I'd keep it simple. If he, uh, if that amendatory veto is overridden, and I would expect that that'll happen on July 8th or 9th, then you're back to this law. And for this board's consideration, what's left in place is this 10-day window. And the board could decide to uh, send this on to the board and direct me to draft an ordinance, you know, banning assault weapons, or decide to do nothing. And we can't take action at a committee of the whole meeting as we've presented it here this evening. So the board could uh, be polled and say, don't send it on, and that's the end of the story. So. Thank you, Ryan. Um, I'll start the uh, discussion with agreeing and echoing the dozens of emails that we've received um, uh, that is not in the best interest of Bartlett to even consider any type of assault weapons ban. Uh, if there's no dissent, I will poll the board to verify that everyone is in agreement to let the 10-day window expire without sending this on to a board meeting for a vote. Clerk, please call the roll. 
Trustee well, Aaron? I don't, is, well, I, th that was a poll of the board, so you were yeah. asking there's no motion. Does, that, does, I guess everyone would weigh in on whether they want to at this stage just say. Any discussion? Oh, so it's not a formal vote. No, it's no, just a polling. A I would, I would say, um, uh, let's wait. Wait, meaning don't do don't anything. Do anything about it right now. Mm -hmm. Well, understand if you don't do it within the ten days, it's forever foreclosed the way the law is currently written. If you did something, you could amend it. But if you don't do anything within the window, you won't have the ability to, in the future, adopt a an assault weapons ban. Not, not that I'm saying that you should do it because of that. I'm just saying waiting could, means you're saying no. T.L., could you clarify what you mean by wait? Well, uh, wait and see. I was thinking because all the other, it, it appears, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Attorney Mraz, it appears that um, <clears throat> Cook County is in uh, uh, everyone, every single village that has passed the uh, uh, assault weapons ordinance is now being challenged in court. I'm not sure I feel comfortable passing something that I know we're going to have to spend a lot of dollars. And, and, and that's my point. If we, right. if we avoid sending this to even a board vote and don't recognize the 10-day window, we're doing exactly that. Right. We're, we're avoiding any ban here. Um, we're avoiding any legal consequences. We're upholding the Constitution. Yeah. Right. Do you have any other comments? I would be in agreement and say that we should let the 10-day window expire and uh, not do anything to uh, uh, try to ban assault weapons in the village of Bartlett. I agree with uh, Trustee Aarons. I think we ought to wait um, and not take any action. It, it doesn't make any sense to me for the village to have to spend all kinds of money on legal fees when the residents wouldn't necessarily be safer. If we pass a ban, maybe an adjacent community would not pass that ban so somebody could have, you know, assault weapons next door and then come to the village. We'd, so we'd spend all that money and we wouldn't be any safer. So it doesn't make any sense to me that we would pursue that course of action. That's right. Well, assuming I agreed that it was a local government's place to put bans on weapons or something like that, and I do not, um, this whole concept is so fraught with error and, and legal issues that uh, Attorney Morales has already spoken about. We're just opening ourselves up for a can of yeah. You know what? And uh, it's just, it's, it's nothing, in my opinion, it's nothing we want to deal with. The state makes the laws on weapons. Let them make the laws. If we're unsatisfied with it, you can go to your legislature. And shame on the General Assembly for leaving us in this position. I mean, it's going to be a, it's going to be a hodgepodge of regulations throughout the state. Really, once again, they, they failed us. Let the window close. So is that a straw poll? At this, at this point, um, I will ask the clerk to call the names of gentlemen who would like to speak, if you would still wish to address the board um, during the committee meeting here. Um, if you hear your name and you're okay with what we've just discussed and you de decline to speak, that's fine as well. She's going to um, read the, all the names that are on the list here. So I'll ask Lauren, uh, the clerk, to do that. Stephen Howell. Yes, I'll just say thank you instead of making a speech. I appreciate your thoughts. Michael Kerbit. Again, thank you. Frank Napolitano. Thank you for your, uh, your service here on the building board and thank you for your full understanding of the Constitution. <laughs> Jim Hall. Thank you, John Brands. Uh, same thing. Uh, Michael Pastorelli. Again, thank you very much. Um, I'm 100% of the way you guys feel that I'm glad to be a successful team on our board. Joe Tomano. Yes, I'll take it. 
I'd like to thank you all for your common sense, your good common sense. I appreciate that. And, and there, there's been a big, big misconception all over the country for a long time about what an assault rifle is. And I'd like to clarify that. Um, I was a, a Marine for 30 years. Uh, I served in Vietnam and Persian Gulf. I think I understand weapons. An assault rifle is a shoulder operated weapon that is able to fire full <coughs> automatic like a machine gun. And if it doesn't fire full automatic, it is not an assault rifle. Uh, I think the chief would agree with that. Um, and and, it, and it, uh, assault rifles have been so uh, broadly used, the, the term, and that everybody thinks anything that looks like an assault rifle is, but it's not. If it doesn't go full automatic, it's not an assault rifle. And full automatic rifles have been outlawed by the federal government since 1935. So it shouldn't even be an issue. If you had a Corvette Chevy and a, and a Chevy station wagon, they really look different. But if you open the hood, they both got a V8. So if you outlaw a Corvette because it goes too fast, what do you do with the station wagon? And by outlawing certain weapons that people think are assault weapons, the sky's the limit and everything will be illegal. And then we've lost the Second Amendment. And the First, Second, and Fourth Amendment are being so badly abused right now that um, that's, that's all I got to say. And thanks again for your good common sense. I appreciate that. Thank you for your service. Leonard Jumelvo? Jumelvo. That's why I had Lorna read these. I'm sorry? <laughs> That's why we, she, she got the short end of the stick and had to read the names. Okay. Uh, Lenny Giambavo, I live here in uh, 328 Mulberry Court. I just want to say thanks for your common sense. Uh, to me, I don't even know why these meetings are taking place. It's a Second Amendment. They shouldn't even come up. You know, uh, what is it, New York passed their gun ban and uh, violent crime rose by 25%. You know, and we've seen the issues in Chicago for many, many years. There was even a point where if a, a citizen wanted to arm himself to protect himself in his own neighborhood, he was considered a felon with Chicago's laws. I, we don't want that in this town, and we hope that you, you know, you did the right thing tonight, but extend that further up on the line when you deal with other legislatures, because it's just wrong. That's our right. You know, the Second Amendment wasn't for deer hunters. It was to, for us to keep in check a government that is going going bad. And that's what we see today. And we need, we need those for more than deer hunting. You know, th that's really all I want to say. But thank you for your common sense. Thank you. Americo Cantu. Lance Lemvik. Again, thank you very much. You appreciate it. It's common sense. You may use common sense. Brad Navarro. I'm going to reiterate what everyone else has stated. Um, I appreciate you guys thinking about this with common sense and understanding the situation. And thank you for supporting the Constitution. Eric Laverne. Uh, mirrors, uh, welcome to new faces. Great to see you explain how to get that. Jim Hunter. Uh, just want to thank you again for everything you guys have done with this. This is the right way to go with, the, with this for our village. Thank you all for your comments. If there is nothing else, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Moved by Trustee Aarons, seconded by Trustee Shipman. Kirk, please call the roll. Trustee Aarons? Yes. Hammer? Yes. Carbonaro? Yes. Ranky? Yes. Shipman? Yes. We are adjourned. Oh, I, I, tried to, I tried to talk for her. I tried to talk for her. I tried to talk for her. I tried to talk for her.